Okay, so we're live. Welcome back to the Magic Minds podcast. I'm Matt Bork. Today I'm joined by a special guest, a bit of a celebrity actually, Dr. Jules Dalby. What is the crack, Jules? Well, I'm not sure about a celebrity, maybe a B-rated celebrity. No, look, you're a champion cyclist, a Guinness record holder, and you also do a bit of work with Conor McGregor as a physiologist. I know they call you the doc, but you're more so a physiologist, right? Um, I do both. Um, oh, do you? Yeah, um, I also do general um, health maintenance. Um, with combat sports, there's always a need for patching up. There's always cuts, bruises and, and injuries. So, yeah, somebody has to do it. So I do that job as well. Tell you, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, the reason I've asked Jules on the show today is for that very reason. The fact that he's a physiologist, uh, a doctor. He's got a long history in sport, not only cycling but combat sports weight training has a huge insights and a knowledge and a professionalism beyond my uh, years you know i've done a bit of studying in sports science so i'm gonna uh, tap into his uh his knowledge today and hopefully share it with you guys just give us a bit of a background for yourself jules um the sport that i came from was originally from cycling um and one of the reasons that i like this is it's, it's quite a technical sport because you're dealing with very fine parameters. The difference between winning and losing is so small. Just a few watts of power output, maybe. It's not like, let's say, Formula One, where you've got hundreds of horsepower to play with. With with that, you're dealing with such small amounts that everything becomes extremely important. All the details become very important. Yeah. Uh, so when did you start your study in physiology? Um while I was in my 20s um, and I, I was cycling, I went to, to college then and then I went on and did a, a degree in, in medicine. I worked for a while in neurology in the US. I worked in, in the UK and the, when I came back to Ireland, I started working in emergency departments um, because the, there's less commitment. You can do the shifts get out, go home, whereas the other areas, you tend to have to follow up more. So it suited me, that the lifestyle suited me. So that was kind of how I got into the combat sports because I was doing um, ring doctor for some of the boxing and the MMA events. All right, cool. Uh, you, you, you have a history in the, the cycling. Uh, you've won a few Irish championships. I read a couple of articles there on Sticky Bottle. Uh, there was an art wrote in 2012. You won a championship a couple of years ago. You, you, yeah, I, I won the Irish Road Race Championships. That's the, the long distance one. Um, but I was probably more suited to the shorter distance events, the track events. So I, I've also won the, 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 t- the 200 metres and various other distances in between. But physiologically, I'm, I'm better suited to the short events. Yeah. But I can blag it on the longer ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little birdie tells me a story about something about when helmets were brought in that you took upon yourself to uh, design your own. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, that? No, I don't think <laughs> we, we can't discuss this particular uh, helmet design. Uh, no, and coconuts. Me. Someone said they were made <laughs> oh, from coconut. Oh, oh, that one. Okay, yeah, we yeah. can talk about the coconuts. <laughs> yeah. I was getting a little worried there. <laughs> no, I, I'm not going to divulge on that you don't want to share okay. with us, but tell us the coconut the one, coconut and then you helmet, can tell me yeah. the other story afterwards no, if you the, want. The other story we won't go into oh, today. All right, right. Um, but the coconut helmet, yeah, at the time um, I was living in Guadeloupe, which is the French Caribbean. And being a, a French colony, they're they're all cycling crazy there. Mm. So I was based out of this um, small island, and there was a, a tree that grew in the backyard, and um, it was there was a big nut. It was actually a thing called a calabash. It looks like a coconut. Right. And um, one of my buddies said, "You know that thing? You could make a helmet out of that. It was bigger." So that gave me the idea that if we if we grew it bigger, big enough to make a helmet, we could harvest it. So we used to water it and we'd pee up against the tree to make <laughs> the thing grow Dally. faster. And it seemed to have worked. And when it reached the, the right size, we were measuring it every few days to get the, the right head size out of it. You're and joking. once it reached the right size, yeah, we, we, we chopped it off and dried it out in the sun. And then uh, I managed to get a, a helmet liner out of a, a construction, a builder's construction helmet bolt that on the inside and uh and make this organic helmet out of it 
Wow. Now, now the only problem was that the, 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 the judges at the bike races, they kept asking me, was it uh, ANSI and Snell approved? Those are the two uh, organizations. <laughs> oh, Snell, is certifies, the, yeah. Snell is the strength, isn't it? Yeah, yeah than the helmets. Of the certifications. So yeah. For a while, I, I said it was pending, but <laughs> <laughs> after a while, they caught up with me and they said, you're not wearing that anymore. So oh, really? That was the end of the coconut helmet. You're a man of many talents. Would you reckon, like, that, that goes to saying, you know, you could bottle your piss. So you're a piss there. <laughs> the Irish piss. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Made coconuts grow. <laughs> yeah, that could be, you know, uh, something for the farmers to get involved in. <laughs> uh, tell us a little about your Guinness Book of Records. You've done that in Raw. What was the story of that? Yeah, that was um, a deadlifting record. So that was lifting the, the most that you can in a, in one hour. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd give that a try. Um, it's not truly a, a power event. And there's a lot of similarities actually between that and cycling. So I had one of the time trial records as well. And both last approximately one hour. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll give this a try because there's a lot of glutes and legs involved in in deadlifting. Right. And um, I probably should have done a dry run first, but it was so much trouble to get all the people organized and the film crew and all that down. Right. That um, I just thought I'd, I'd go for it on the day. So I stacked on a load of plates yeah. and, uh, and went for it. And after about three minutes uh, into it, I thought there's a long way to go and there's no way I'm going to keep this up for right. 10 minutes, let alone an hour. So I kept stripping it back and stripping it back until right. I ended up with a, a pretty lightweight and ended up just going at it fast. But the problem with it is that you can never really um, just keep going. You can't just pace yourself all the way through. Let's say if you're rowing or running, you slow your pace. With this, I ended up lifting it a bit, taking a rest, lifting a bit. So okay. uh, I wasn't sure, but then at the end of it, when it was all tallied up, um, I'd lifted, I think it was 64 tons in the hour. So that was the cumulative weight yeah, multiplied by the reps. Wow. That's savage. Um, you only get credited if you lift the weight up, so you don't get credited with moving your own body mass. Yeah. So if you go too light, you're moving up and down, but not getting much credit for it. So there's a... There's a sweet spot there where right. you you have enough weight to keep going, but not too not too light that you're not credited. Right, gotcha. Deadly, savage, savage, savage. Uh, I know you. I've been at a couple of uh, K ones and that kickboxing, but as you say, you you work with the McGregor's. How did you get involved with that? When did where did that all come about? That all started um, a few years back after Connor had. Um, fought for the first time against Nate Diaz uh, Connor he was doing well he was obviously like leading through the first few rounds but then he just started to run out of steam um, I think part of the problem was that he'd gone up in weight to make a higher weight category mm. he'd eaten a lot he'd gained some fat I've seen that. which probably didn't do him any favours because when you gain fat, the, the fat tissue is like any other tissue. It has a metabolic demand. Yeah, absolutely. So that tissue is using up oxygen that could be going to working muscle. And it's taking away from the muscle. So in that, with hindsight, he probably would have been better off coming in lighter right. and having a higher VO2 max, a higher vi ability to take up oxygen. Mm. But he basically just ran out of steam and ended up losing the fight. So his coach, John Kavanagh, um, who always seems to be implicated in just about everything, somehow it always comes down to blame John Kavanagh. But he, right. he he approached me because I'd been doing ring doctor for the um, for some of the MMA events. Yeah, I've seen you and, at the Michigan ones. Yeah, and he he knew about my background in cycling and sports physiology. Hmm. So he asked, could uh, I step in and help out with Connor's uh, conditioning? to get him ready for the next fight against uh, Nate Diaz, a rematch. Um, because it didn't sit well to have lost that fight with Connor. So we did um, a couple of months training. Um, Connor improved rapidly. He, he He's a great uh, student. He, he, if you give him the work, he'll just get down to it and do it. <coughs> and he fought um, five hard rounds against Nate Diaz and came out the victor 
in the end. Yeah, there was I seen the first fight and then I seen the second fight and uh, yeah, there was a huge difference in his uh his cardio conditioning, let's say. Uh it was unbelievable to change. There was, and a lot of it was learning how to pace himself because we'd been training with heart rate monitors. He was able to see the, the metabolic cost of let's say throwing a, a kick versus a a jab. Right, how much right. it would cost. And so he, he, got so sp- he got really specific with it. He got very good at learning exactly how far he could push himself and how to recover, let his lactate levels drop between rounds during the rest yeah. between rounds. Brilliant. I've seen like, the build-up to you. You've done a lot of cycling with him. You know, well, that the- wasn't actually... That wasn't actually the case. People imagine that there's a lot more cycling. That's what I want to know. How does that, because, you know, I'm I'm kind of knowledgeable about the systems, you know, the the different systems you do, anaerobic and aerobic, how would cycling cross over to MMA? So people are thinking, he's out doing loads of cycling, let's do that. Yeah. Talk to him. Well, there's two things there. One is um, Conor had had an ACL tear. So he had a, a knee injury that prevented him from running. Uh, I would have preferred to have had him running because it's more sports specific. Yeah, the upright brilliant. posture. It, it's it would have been better for the stand up. I was dying to ask MMA. that question. So it, it was a second choice, and it's just the it was working around with what was there. Right. The other aspect is that people tend to see what's put out on video and what's right. available, and obviously you, you don't want the skills component. You don't want people watching you too closely of course seeing what you're doing in sparring because there's a lot of to be gained by watching somebody sparring during pads or whatever you, you can you can see patterns emerge you see you can predict where people are going to be mm, if they mm. if they throw a shot do they step out do they step sideways you'll start to see it if that information is out there mm. so the stuff that w- that was put out on video tended to be things that weren't really going to give a lot of the game away. Of course, yeah, yeah. That's so, and the cycling is quite photogenic as well, out yeah. of course. It's the two he's had you the tops off. Yeah, I've of never course. Seen you. <laughs> Deadly, it's absolutely brilliant. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was seen as more. The, the other things, the bulk of the training was still the sparring, the, the pads, the bag work. Sports specific, and Sports I say specific. that to, to people, you know, rowers do row and exactly. footballers play mini games, you know. But a few people had asked me, like, why is he cycling? And I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll find out because the crossover is not the same. Be using different systems. It's not. But yeah, that, that's a that's a that's a brilliant answer. Where did the uh, the fast program come out? Of? Um, it it was based on the the training system that Connor had used in the preparation for the second Nate Diaz fight. So the the fast system it's it's an abbreviation of fighter aerobic anaerobic system of training. Brilliant. So it's a way of of using zone based cardiac training, plus some high intensity interval training or hit training yeah, yeah, put yeah. in as well, uh, alternating be, between the the two, and it's also periodized training. Right. So it allows for recovery periods, which is something that you'll see a, a lot in, in other sports, particularly a- athletics um, mm. and sports where, where people are trying to peak. And right. it's one of the most common um, things that I'd see with, with your, your Joe Average that goes down to a gym. He has his little notepad, his routines. <laughs> his tripod. His tripod. And he, he just does the same thing day after day, year after year, and probably doesn't make a whole lot of gains in terms of strength fitness um because they're they're not periodizing their training they just they expect to be able to just continue on the same level yeah, yeah, well obviously yeah. a biological system it's going to adapt it's going to plateau out yeah so the the only way to get it to adapt is to stress it above and beyond what it's already capable of doing so mm. now you're in a catch 22 situation if you want to get more stress you have to get to a new level Right. But how do you get to that new level because you're not capable of getting there? So the, so one of the ways to do that is is to periodize your training. Right. Um so we'll do periods scheduled active recovery periods. Right. And then after coming back from that it'll be, you know, more intense um and sometimes more volume as well yeah. when we come back in. So 
if you were to look at the progress, it would be more like a staircase rather than a stepping stone. A stepping yeah, stones absolutely. rather than just a continuous upwards gradient, yeah. which is never really going to work long term. Yeah, dig a hole, fill it back in. Dig a hole, fill it back in. Dig a hole, fill it back exactly. in, and then before you know, you've a mound. Exactly, solid mound. That's yeah. savage. Are you familiar with heart rate variability? Does it? Does it? Yeah, is that something you've ever looked into? We, we, we do use that, but for elite athletes, it's probably less useful than it is for for less elite athletes. Right. So it, it can be useful to see if you're overtraining, mm, looking at the nervous system. Yeah, um, but one of the more basic um, and, and cruder and sometimes overlooked is, is just your, your your resting heart rate. First thing in the morning. First thing in the morning. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And temperature as well. Yeah, but particularly resting at heart rate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if that's all, if it's up, there's something going down, isn't it? T- typically, I mean, sometimes it can be anxiety or, or something like that. But if you take that in context with other things, let's say you're you're feeling weak or you're feeling irritable, mm. um, if you're not sleeping well. If you're off your food a little bit or you're, you're selecting certain types of foods, sometimes you'll get a, more of a craving for high calorie foods mm. um, in contact with other signs of, of over training. Um, just the, the basic resting heart rate is very good. Yeah. Um, but as I say, you have to take these things as a as a group. You can't take a single word because it's only in a context that yeah. means something. Yeah, so yeah. it's like reading a, a sentence as a group of words. That means something. A single word doesn't mean much on its own. So just, just like one, of, one of these variables, if it's out, it may be that you could train, yeah. but you're just looking for an excuse. Out. So, <laughs> so you, it, it's, it's, it's knowing when you actually need to rest yeah. and when you're just being a wuss. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, it, it's a bit like Marmite something when you talk about Conor McGregor when you say stuff to people you know either like him they don't like him and a lot of it's generally when I talk to people it's about his personality and I don't really know about his personality I don't really want to know about that but one thing about him I come across and I'm not into MMA but I got into looking I'm watching these videos and how he trains he's seriously seriously professional isn't he? Um, he is he's a, a very unusual very unique individual um, there was there was one incident that that did stand out in my mind. This was in New York, in um, the the basketball stadium in um, Madison Square Gardens, and he'd just done a a hard uh, sparring session, yeah, um, and uh, uh, some training drills for the for the press conference. So he was sweating and he he was he was quite tired, and somebody handed him a basketball. And asked him to throw it through one of the hoops. Now it would have been very easy just to to, to, to laugh it off or just smile and turn away. But he he stepped up, he took the challenge, and he he launched the ball, and somehow I knew it was just going to go in. And first shot from a distance, straight in through the hoop, and he just like you know smiled and walked away. There was no need for him to do it. He took a big risk doing it, but it went in. And I think that that kind of shows two aspects one he's not afraid to put it all on the line yeah and two is yeah people say his launch was all wrong the white man can't jump and all that kind of <laughs> thing. but um the fact is it went in and he has exceptional abilities um spatial awareness yeah he he does have a certain genius at that just like this genius is on all different levels but i can see it in a lot of the the, the ways that he will, let's say, how he can work a press room. He knows where all the cameras are placed. Yeah, yeah, he he yeah. just has very good awareness of where everybody is and where a, an opponent can be, what possible moves that they can make and what they're, he's probably thinking several moves ahead. Yeah. For me, I'm lucky if I can predict somebody one move ahead, but he's yeah, already probably yeah. 10 moves ahead. I just think he gets far too much stick because of the stuff that the media put out there in comparison to the, the perfect, like if he was a businessman, he'd be, he'd be, be knighted. Like well, he is a businessman. <laughs> but, you, but you know what I mean? It was outside combat sports. It was outside, yeah. it was, it was something more socially acceptable to say that people don't turn their nose up. He'd be, he'd be glorified. But the fact that he does things wrong, I think he gets a bit of stick for but he's done unbelievably well for Irish sports, Irish MMA, 
you know, I just think he's a phenomenal athlete, you know, he, and he's he, he is. And whether whether you like him, uh, want to see him win, or you hate him and want to see the his cocky ass get kicked. Mm. Either way, it's it's pay per views. He sells tickets. And that's, that's what's the all bottom about. Line. Yeah, that's like, what it's all about. yeah. So personality, who gives a rat? <laughs> uh, one thing I wanted to ask you as well is 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 weight cutting. There was a, there was a recent documentary with with Darren Till. And it's it's getting a lot of you know it's getting a lot of media attention. What's your thoughts on the whole weight cutting? What way is it done? What we do? I've not seen Connor coming up the fight, and then the day of it, he looked really gaunt. Or like not just Connor, any fight. Can you just talk me through a bit of that? Yeah, well, it's one of these necessary evils. I mean, it's, right. it's the difference in a weight category is huge. I, I know we get used to watching Hollywood when you get big guys take on small guys and stuff like that but at elite level size makes a huge difference so like it or not we're stuck with it you got to put guys in categories now the problem is how and when do you weigh these guys to put them in those categories so the way it's done at the moment is that the the weighing in is typically done in the morning and then the fight will be the the following evening Mm. so Typically, you'll have about 30 hours between the weigh-in and the actual competition itself. Right. Now that's that can lead to some problems in guys cutting too much weight and taking extreme measures okay. just so that they can make weight for the and day what, before. What are these kind of things that they do? Like how? Like in that short period of time, do they just train, train, train? Do they reduce water? What do they do? Like fighters in general? Okay, well, ideally. A fighter will come in not too far away from from their weight category. Well, sometimes a lot of them don't, do they? They don't. They they'll come in um, and try to do extreme measures, lose too much water. Like that's scary physiologically, isn't it? It it, it is. Um, the the other problem with it, unlike let's say sports, like um, where there are weight cuts, let's say bodybuilding mm. or or jockeys, but probably more bodybuilding let's take that as an example all that the bodybuilder has to do is walk out on stage right. he doesn't have to actually physically perform yeah the jockey well yeah he has to perform but not quite to the same level it's not quite as important how how your physical conditioning is as it is in combat sports so it's not just a question of making weight the day before and, and showing up mm. coming in heavier You've got to be able to be on top shape, be able to put out a, a high performance, sporting performance as well. So there's a certain percentage that you can lose and replace in that period of time. Sometimes guys will will try to not eat. They'll exercise a lot the day before, lose a lot of glycogen. Right. Um, glycogen typically holds on about four times its weight in water yeah so it gives a quite a dramatic weight cut yeah, good yeah, weight yeah. loss but the problem is in that period of time in one day you're not going to fill up your glycogen stores again to replenish them to replenish them it takes a couple of days it takes a it? couple of days four exactly. three or four days or more anybody or that's more. ever been involved in uh, let's say running or triathlon or something mm. knows that if you get the the, the knock or you hit the wall as the they wall, say the bunk, yeah. it'll be it'll be days before you feel right again before you can top up those glycogen stores the water provided it hasn't been too extreme if it's let's say about seven percent of your total body weight okay. you should be able to replace that reasonably well and then yeah. come in the next day um and be in good shape how do they recover after losing so much weight but obviously they have to exercise exercise cut work or how do they perform the next day is beyond me well if they've done it right uh, most of the work has been done beforehand in the few weeks leading up to it yeah where there's been a gradual loss and it's been a, a loss of fat yeah so that that's a long-term thing and that's where probably most of the fighters go wrong they leave it too late or they, they don't do it right or they're not disciplined enough and they come in carrying too much body fat and then try to compensate by water loss. Right. Whereas it's um, it, it's it's a, it's a something that you can only do a certain amount. Like this guys will come in trying to come in, let's say 15% of their body weight in water as a loss. Yeah. Now you're not going to, you're not going to, 
make up that you're going to lose too many electrolytes no matter how much you drink even yeah. if you use IV drips which which are illegal that, yeah I was going to ask you about that um, you're still not going to be in, in good shape 30 hours later yeah are they are they are they doing a profession though I know Connor has you involved and other people but are, are, the way I see it is a professional sport are they do they are they properly watched and minded by nutritionists are they doing it right or do they do it by themselves or what's the um, the the better the more higher paid ones will have assistance but compared with other sports it's it's still in its infancy it, it's not the most technical um, it, like MMA is a, is a very new sport a fast growing mm. sport um, so there's still a lot to be learnt um, from it and I think that's where the background that I have from a, let's say cycling which is a sport that's had over a hundred years to perfect yeah. it and develop uh, systems and um, team infrastructure that that's a lot easier model to follow whereas a lot of these guys they're just winging it they're they're learning as they go along yeah yeah because I says like why don't you just I hear strength condition go strength condition go strength condition. I'm like bring someone in that's knowledgeable about nutrition and do it 20 weeks 6 months beforehand and then be ready come up to the week I was like why did they not do that yeah, most of the nutritionists in in the sport of um, MMA, I, I find, are guys that were had a career themselves in MMA, and now they think they'll just take up being a nutritionist, um, rather than kind of the other way around, where you have somebody that's studied and, and, and learned, even if they don't uh, do a sport themselves they may have the the, you know, the the knowledge to do it yeah they know the systems they know the systems and they're they not emotionally knowledge. involved in the sports oh just this is the way we used to always do it no this is the uh, proper way to do it yeah exactly and but boxing you'll see that there's a huge amount of tradition still in boxing there's a lot of stuff that's done just simply because it's always been done and it may not the way be we always did it yeah yeah draconial ways of training even you know yeah, I, I, I see that people, I don't know, being punched in the abdomen thinking that somehow it's going to toughen them up. No, it's just going to bruise you up. It's not going to give you better abs no matter how much you get punched. Yeah, I, I was just talking to a physio. I was talking to an OT today and the one physio told her to get out and do deadlifts. She wants to get her abs up. Okay. <laughs> I know, I just went, okay. The unusual uh, deadlift, I think, that will do that. Yeah, I just said, stay off the uh, the curly whirlies and the, uh, the, the the supermax, and that might help you a little bit more in your deadlifts, and she just uh, laughed at me. Yeah, uh, um, that that's another one that I, I find odd, and it's, it's quite a, a recent phenomenon, it seems. If somebody's carrying a, a, a bit of body fat, and you'll often hear them, hey, i got to hit the gym. Um, whereas if you went back 200 years ago, and somebody had um, you know a, a, a high let's say high BMI a lot of body fat mm. the assumption was that the person ate well but now the assumption is that you need to work out and people have this association that training and, and body composition are closely related and they seem to neglect the elephant in the room which is diet okay so it does have a small bearing but it's minimal, com- minimal compared with diet the influence on, on body composition that, that training has. Maybe if you're doing ultra marathons or Ironman triathlon, yeah. yeah. And half of that's just simply because you're you're training so long you just don't have time <laughs> to eat a, a big plate of uh, fish and chips. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You have so many hours that you, that you just don't have access to food or maybe not the food that you want. Um, but yeah, that's the whole nutritional aspect of, of things. I think it's... Um, it's it's all overlooked hugely. Yeah, I've always said, even when I was in college doing my degree, and I had a, a chat with a lecturer, physiologist, I won't say his name, but I used to say it was 85% diet, 15% training. And he's like, no, no, not a chance. And I says, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I think it's it's probably even more. I think it's minimum I think even more. <laughs> yeah, like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's, it's, it's the, the, the effects of exercise is minimal. You know what I mean? Walking on a treadmill for an hour is not going to go anywhere near having a, a curry chips on it and a quarter pounder no and walking on a, or running on a treadmill the amount of, even if you do if you do 30 minutes on a treadmill you you may burn around 300 calories mm. for, for a typical person yeah yeah well you have one snickers bar and it's what like it's a, over 300 calories so all your hard work's just gone off mm. by that one snickers bar that you had to reward yourself mm. at the end of it 
you're pissing up a drain pipe. Oh, uh, easily, easily. Yeah, yeah. What's your thoughts on on mental health in in combat sports and sports? And is it? Um, that's it's a very elaborate question that because I think the the sample bias, what what type of people are drawn into combat sports? So it tends to be extreme individuals. It tends to be, um, people that maybe you know they have something to prove to themselves or they may be um they may be just extreme individuals so i think you are going to get more people with mental health issues in combat sports as opposed to let's say team sports mm. yeah it's i just some recently done a, a podcast with a guy called shane kirkland and he you know so for mental health and you know, he found, found it difficult in that industry to, to talk about it you know well, I, I guess any place where you have like a you know quite a a, a macho element. Mm. I mean, it doesn't get much more macho than <laughs> than combat sports. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. It's probably the most fundamental. I, I know people don't like to talk about it. People like to put it down or call it dirty, as as you said earlier. But um, I mean, of all sports, it's probably the most basic, most fundamental of all sports. Yeah. Um, other sports are probably civilized variants of war and battle, but this is just you know all the all the fluff has been trimmed away, and it's just yeah. basically down to it, man against man. Yeah, yeah. There's no so room for it that. is it is a macho environment. So um, I guess it, it it is you know hard to talk about. Would they lose their edge? Not necessarily, but. I think it's it's just not an easy environment to to bring it up or, or to to talk about it. Yeah, and I guess the the result is there's quite a high suicide rate in combat sports. Yeah. Well, as we said, par- partly because of the the people that were attracted to it, and partly because of the environment of the sport itself. Yeah. MMA has got really popular, like just like you know any contact sports, you know, like rugby or cycling. What advice would you give to anyone that's is going to start taking up and at least start taking up combat sports or a contact sport? What advice would you give to them? Um, decide what they want to do. Are they, do they want to do it competitively or do they want to do it for fitness and, and just for a fun thing to do? Um, if you're going to do it competitively, decide on a long-term plan. Try to decide how many years you're going to do it for. I mean, there's not many 50-year-olds that are still in combat sports. It, it's it's something that you're probably best off getting in and getting out quick. Yeah, certainly you can do training, you can do other f- forms, you can do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you can do d- Judo or Kaipo era. Um, but for MMA in particular, it's not a sport that you you expect to have a long life expectancy in. So decide, have a plan, decide what you want to do, how many years you're going to give towards achieving that and get out. Well, how would you, how would you, how do you stay safe in contacts in them contact sports like rugby, like MMA? What's the, how do you, how do you, how do you advise people to stay safe? Um, I mean, it's one of these things easier said than done. <laughs> Once you get into the, the heat of the moment, you can tell people, you can give them all a good advice, but it pretty much all goes out the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what would your, what would you describe as the pillars of health, the things to do? Um, Are you sleeping, training, what's your... Yeah, it, it depends when when people say health. It tends to be a catch-all. Um, people imagine that it's it's freedom from disease that it's high performance that it's living a long time um but a lot of these things are actually mutually exclusive you can't have you can't have them them all yeah if you want to live a long time probably the single best thing you can do is starve yourself you it works for pretty much any laboratory animal yeah if you can calorie restriction calorie restriction the whole organism slows down or I'll die if I don't eat. Well, you won't. You'll die slowly. <laughs> <laughs> We're dying slowly anyway. We're dying slowly, but you'll die extra slowly. But maybe you'll just wish you were dead quicker because you're you're miserable. <laughs> if, uh, mice that you starve, they'll live longer, but they're they're not as active. 
they tend to have lower libidos i mean if you want to live your life like that well go ahead maybe it's better to you know burn short and fast than long and slow <laughs> so you take your pick and decide which one's for you the same thing with performance um yeah okay so we all know exercise is great yeah it's great in small doses in moderation but for for competitive sport for a lot of elite sports the amount of training necessary isn't really in that level it, mm. it's it's gone above and beyond as i've and often it, said that athletes are not the healthiest people in the world and people are like but they have abs and they're lean like that doesn't mean that they're healthy yeah a lot you have of to be obsessed a lot of them um particularly in let's say ultra distance sports they have a con, like a considerably lower life expectancy than 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 the average population so it's it's not all good yeah a little exercise moderate exercise great but the stuff needed for for competition and, and high performance may not be the healthiest. Mm. What's your thoughts on sleep? As a as a sleep um, is is one of the secret weapons, and that's something that that's hugely underrated. And um, for for so many different standpoints, um, I I think that it's it's something that it's only been the surface has only been scratched in in sports. Um, I was using some of the the, the trackers and the, the sleep tracking systems, okay. which um, ranked how you performed and how quick your reaction times were. Um, and they measured it, funnily enough, against blood alcohol levels. Okay. So there was a, a it was given as the equivalent in, in blood alcohol level how how quick you you could react. And these were used by the the U.S. Navy for their fighter pilots to um, to see who they'd rotate. Because if you're sending a guy off to a different time zone, let's say you're sending a guy to Iraq or something like that, mm. um, you have to know who's capable of of having quick reaction times, who's capable of flying, and who you're going to keep on the on the ground. So there was some quite complex algorithms that were made up depending on how much you'd slept, not just the night before, but yeah. even the preceding week, and how restful the sleep was, how much you, you moved during the, the night. So by having good restful sleep, you, you'll have quicker reaction times, you recover quicker. A lot of cell turnover mm. um, only happens during sleep. So so the recovery is faster from that standpoint. Things like uh, growth hormone, a lot of that, and a lot of other hormones are mm. released on, during sleep. Yeah. So it, it is hugely important. Have you heard of a book called The Oxygen Advantage? Uh, I, I haven't. Have you not? No. It's by a guy called Patrick McDonald or something like that, but he talks about uh, you know, proper breeding, i.e. nose breeding, just predominantly just breeding through the nose. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's a book I have. I might lend it to you. You might be interested yeah in. i mean it's that's uh something that's been explored for quite a couple quite a long time at least a few thousand years um i mean a lot of the, the yoga breathing and, yeah. and stuff like that ha, has has gone into it um and that is something that i think may be a little i'd put that in the opposite end of the scale to the sleep people underestimate sleep and they overestimate breathing yeah, I guess it's good. Uh, let's say for people with panic attacks, yeah, breathing works great. Uh, it helps to to relax people. It just gives them to something to focus on, just like counting sheep. But the, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you count your breathing. But the the reality is, if somebody, if a kid, if your kid threatens, they'll hold their breath until they die. Yeah, well, you of course you're going to ignore them. Why? Because what's going to happen is, they, if they do hold their breath long enough, they pass out. Their, the breathing center in their hypothalamus just kicks back in again and it automates their, their breathing. So it's, it's an automated system that we have some voluntary control over also. So if you try something, let's say you breathe a little too quick, you try and blow up an airbed with your mouth mm. and you blow off a lot of carbon dioxide, you become a little alkali, you become lightheaded. The same thing, you, you'll you'll pass out if you keep doing it too long and it normalizes you go back to homeostasis back to stability again or you'll just gradually over the next couple of minutes you'll breathe less and your carbon dioxide accumulates and you go back to that steady state 
Your body's mm. always looking for this steady state homeostasis. So by the trying equilibrium. to yeah, by by breathing through your your nose, your mouth, it's it's you, you can look at at sports where, let's say, like swimmers. Mm. If you watch the um, Olympic swimmers when they come in, and you watch them look up at the the, the boards to see what time they are, they, they've they've obviously they've given it full exertion, but as soon as they come in. They've been holding their breath. They've been controlling their breathing. They're still able to give maximum output, like top performances. And this is guys that have restricted breathing. Yeah. So if it was so made such a difference, whether you breathe through your nose or breathe through your mouth, don't you think like the swimmers wouldn't be able to yeah. perform as they do? Yeah, that's there's, brilliant. There's also um, uh, there's, there's people for, for various reasons that will they're they're not able to breathe through their nose or they they may have um let's say a, a tracheostomy and they're, right. they're breathing through their their trachea so you you've just bypassed the the whole nose mouth thing yeah and those people they they still get by so it's not like <laughs> life or death life or death yeah. they've just got a hole in them the air is getting in yeah. okay so it might be a bit chilly like your nose warms the air and it moisturizes it adds to the humidity but it's not making a vast difference. No, it's not like uh, painting the wall green. You go, wow, that's green. You're never going to get that effect, are you? No, no. So my guess on the, the, the breathing and the breathing technique things is, yeah. yeah it's quite a show. Just say that. On, I wouldn't say that, but I wouldn't put it in the same category as So it's, as new, sleep. it's now my new uh, coffee, uh, coffee, tea, co- cozy. You can put me coffee on it. That's I, what I, I, think so. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Good question for you. Do you think do you think boxers and combat sports people get paid enough? You know, we talk about all the money on the you know the glorifying the news, sky. He's getting millions this and this. But do you think they get paid enough for the, the for the job that they do, considering the health risks involved? Well, the, the, uh, first you said um, you know, MMA fighters and boxers. Now they're two completely different categories there. Of course. So so the boxers. Um, when I, I was checking them out on the rich lists, and they're all surprisingly wealthy. Boxing right. gets paid. Right. Um, now, MMA is pretty much, at the moment, there is only one league, and that's the UFC, the, the Ultimate Fighting Championships. And the UFC has, has controlled guys, hmm. and it's it's done a very good job of it. Until very recently, guys were fighting for just a couple of, thousand dollars like even, even the that names. in itself just drives me demented let's stick with MMA because I don't think boxers get paid enough either I just think mm. they should get millions and millions because of the damage but they do done. get millions and millions well give millions. them more then right <laughs> give them more and they should give MMA people more money like the, the contact and the, the head trauma and the, the stuff that, that, that happens they should get a lot more money well before um, Conor McGregor came along none of the guys in in the UFC were making much money now he's kind of upset the apple cart Absolutely. because he set a new precedence and all the other guys are now looking for, for more money as well. Um, what does he call a red panty now? Well, th- yeah, <laughs> that's that's the payoff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, everybody is, is, is now like trying to get more and, and the salaries and the, the, the purses have gone up in MMA, but still nothing like as close as boxing. Yeah. Um, it's pretty well, glorified, isn't it? It's 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 in the public. Sky Sports are doing a great job. BT. The, it is. I mean, it's it's drawing it. the numbers. It's getting the views. So I mean, I don't see why the the guys, the big names, should be compensated for for what they do. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the money's quite shit, and they, you know, UFC is everywhere, and it's quite popular. But they're not looking after their no. Their, the their t shirts athletes. are selling. The pay per views are coming in, but the the athletes, most of them. Um, are still fighting for, for just a couple of thousand, a couple of tens of thousand. Per Shocking, fight. isn't it? The, the amount of like, well, when you consider think, how short their careers are, absolutely. Not, most of them are gonna, only going to have a, the number of professional fights you could count on your probably your your fingers and uh, and maybe even your fingers and toes. Right, but um, it's not like a sport. Let's say golf, where you can. You're still going to be playing. You could be 50 years old and still playing great golf with yeah. a huge long career. Nobody has a long career in 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 MMA. No, oh, so they should be well. So you make your money, and and if you don't make it quick, you're never going to make it. Get out of there. Here's one for you. 
you know when they say they go into the camp so i'm going to start my camp at 16 or it's 12 weeks mm. what does that entail what what is a camp how does it give i'm a, still trying to figure out myself uh, what yeah. a camp is so i'm so, trying to i thought this was like this certain plan this is what they do i wanted to get the inside yeah, of that. i i think it's it's again it's one of these archaic um ideas that you'd get fit in a couple of weeks so right. you'd go off You'd isolate yourself. You'd start like training hard. You'd start eating right. You'd quit smoking. And <laughs> what? I, 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 this is what I'm guessing the, the concept of the camp. To me, it doesn't have any physiological reasoning to do a training camp. Yeah, you should be fit. You should be fit and stay fit all year round. It's something you keep chipping away at. You can't just go four weeks out or six weeks out and say, "All right, I'm starting the training camp now." Yeah, like so going away I've on been holiday. I've been on a few of them, but I'm still trying to figure out like what is a camp. <laughs> yeah, look, I thought it was just like this place they go. I know they go. I know Anthony Joshua With tents and, and caravans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they go like for twelve weeks and it starts. I'm like, I'd love to know what it is. Week one, we do this. Week two, we do this. Is there a progression? When does the, the nutritionist come in? When does the strength condition is it tapered? Mm so it's not it's just a kind of a well for, an for abstract the, thing that you just throw out there it's an abstract thing it's just a, a yeah I, I guess it's the period of time between when a, a fighter is matched up for a, a fight and, and when it actually happens and he, he starts to try and panic and get in shape then but um, lose the belly get the hair up yeah that, that type of thing <laughs> but um, for the the, the, the so called camps that um, that I've been involved with I've I've just treated them as um, normal preparations um, with principles that have been borrowed from from other sports, where where the training is periodized and then tapered leading up to the event. So mm. we typically we'd we'd put it in in training cycles, see how many training cycles we can fit in in the period before the fight. So we don't want to overtrain, but we want to get as as, as much in as possible mm. without overtraining, and then doing a taper. Um, maybe two weeks out and this taper involves reducing the risk of injury which is a, a huge factor Deadly. Um, especially when there's sparring involved and um, there's a lot of potential there for hand injuries and yeah, yeah, just... and, and cuts even just banging heads if a, an open wound that can o- o- open up during a fight it can mean a fight stoppage even if you're doing well yeah, just yeah, because yeah. A, a, an existing cut's just reopened it's not healed so, properly yeah no. uh, the one thing that stood out to me though when I, when I heard that you were back and you were involved with Connor was and he was talking that there was a lot more rest involved and I, I know from, from other fighters resting is not a thing to do no because a lot of it is anxiety driven right and we, we do have the scheduled rest periods where, whether they they come in or not because a lot of a lot of times what will happen is as the fight draws closer the anxiety builds up so the fighter starts training more and more wow. until he overtrains. So we have it, it built in. We have it scheduled. Like it or not, you know, there's an active recovery coming in. So we'll typically, after a few weeks, we'll we'll have a scheduled active recovery week. And part of this is is the mental rest. So it gives you something to look forward to. You know, it's not just train, 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 and with, with no end in sight. You have these short term goals where you can see there's going to be a recovery week coming up. So it allows you to train with more intensity during the, the training period when you know that you're going to have a recovery period coming up. Yeah. So you, you might have heard um, Connor talking about like the, the light switch concept. Yeah. So you, you're training, you're stimulating yeah. on or else you're resting and recovering and you're off. So the short term cycles, let's say on a daily cycle, a circadian rhythm yeah. where you, you train and then you sleep at night. And you recover during that period. If you were to try and train during the night, mm. it wouldn't really benefit you. You'd, no. you'd just be exhausted. At the end of the week, you'd be worse. I love the whole cadian rhythm and training around. Do you, re- do you reckon, according to the cadian rhythm, you can probably correct me on this one, between four in the afternoon and eight at night is, is an optimal time for training? Yeah, that's right. Um, most world records um, are set in sports in, in the, that later part, late afternoon, early evening. So it kind of knocks the, the nail on the head for this 
get up at the crack of dawn, have a cold shower and <laughs> this, this suffering concept. A lot of people would be glad to hear that. Yeah. That the exercise first thing in the morning is probably not the best thing to do. Mm. Okay, if you don't have a choice and you're not able to train all, any other time, do it. But it's not optimal. No, if you're a performing athlete, it's not something you do because, you know, dopamine levels, you know, melatonin at night and the whole cycle, you just Cortisol can't get it. levels are high. There's high in the morning. Do, do you call it the, the, the dawn phenomenon, isn't it? Uh, high, uh, high cortisol. There's a whole... Uh, I call it can't get up out of bed phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason. Your body's telling you something. But you're, you're not like, ready no, for it. <laughs> I'm getting up, I'm getting up because I've got to go run seven miles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I told a mate of mine that I was coming on or I was getting you on to the show and he went Jules Jesus he's in some nick for an outfit and I went I'm oh. an outfit we're the we're same age <laughs> how do you stay in good shape you're in great nick actually how do you do it what do you do um, I, I train consistently is one thing um, people find time for what what's important to them okay. so even if you're traveling even if you're on holidays I'll still find w some way to stay active um, without being uh, uh, obsessional about it. Yeah. So so being consistent is is one. Another is um, diet. Um, a lot of guys when they're when they leave competition, they think that they can get by with a sloppy diet. But a diet, it's something that that you're going to follow. It's a, it's a plan for life. So it doesn't matter what you're doing. If 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 your diet is is poor, you're going to have poor health. Yeah. What what does your diet consist of? What, what you know? Do you, as you just said there, we touched on earlier. Do you go for a, a low caloric diet? Do you go low carbs? Do you go high fat? What what do you generally? Or do you just eat just whole foods? What's your your you, choice? Yeah, I try to eat whole foods. You you, can, you generally don't go too far wrong eating whole foods. Um, the, the single most important aspect of of diet, and a lot of people overlook, is the total amount of calories. You can still eat good foods, whole foods, and still be overweight, carrying a lot of fat if you're eating too much. Mm. So you you have to know when is enough without binge eating, without worrying, keeping your, your insulin level stable by continuous small meals, not missing them. So one of the things I'll often do is uh, I'll prepare, let's say I'm traveling, I'll make little meals to go with me right. so that I don't have to go for let's say eight hours without eating right then i'm going to be ravenous i'm going to be seeking out high calorie foods high fat high sugar foods you can avoid that by having little snacks just to just to stave off that hunger so a, a huge part of it is your total calories just avoiding overeating yeah binge eating yeah so i'd, I'd basically i'd follow um, a, a pretty whole food diet um, mixed diet and where where possible um, I'll try and you know, have quite a high protein intake um, I, I'm, I don't take a, a lot of fats in part of the reason for that is um, they tend to be tasty it's very easy to overeat on, on fatty foods and you can't you can't equate the, the, the amount that you eat and you know you think you're only having a small bit but it could be it's 6 or very, 700 calories at very once, calorie yeah. dense yeah um, and one of the other thing is that, that pretty much all diets work. I mean, there's different fad diets. Um, some have high fat, some have high protein. They, they, they'll, they'll all work, but they all work on the same principle. If you tally up the total calories that have been consumed at the end of the week, they, any diet that's, that's causing somebody to lose weight has less calories in it. Mm. And a lot of it's just restrictions. So by telling a person you can only eat X foods mm. and they're avoiding others, they'll always have that little edge to their hunger. Mm. And that's what's keeping them lean. It's that. It's just that restriction. The sweet spot. Yeah, I've read many books over the last couple of years, you know, whether it be from Tim Noakes or any of these other guys that wrote, you know, low carb yeah. or high fat, all these. They nearly all, and I follow uh, Lynn Norton as well on yeah. uh, Twitter. It's basically, it all boils down to the, keeping it with under your, your caloric uh, need. Bang, bang on or, or under if you want to lose weight. Yeah, you know, if you want to go maintenance, you stay with what you're meant to, what your, your, your litres as a car is. That's what you yeah. go. You go with yeah. your two litre, you stick with two litres. If you want to lose weight, you just drop it down a couple of litres. Yeah, there was an interesting study done where there were patients in intensive care units 
Yeah. So they don't have any control over their activity levels or, or what they're eating or whatever. So ju- they're just being fed this parenteral nutrition. They're being fed through straight into their bloodstream. And it's been tested giving them high carb diets, high protein diets and high fat diets. And there was, the, the end result is there's pretty no, much no difference between them. It's just how many calories you're giving the, the person, whether the person gains weight or they lose weight. But people just don't want to, to buy into because it's too simplistic. Well, food has so many connotations. There's so many like associations with motherly love or religion or the, people can't see the wood for the trees. They mm. get blinded by whether it's organic or so many different things, whether it's kosher or all these other little labels. And they're not able to see just the, the basic what, I, what the macronutrients and the total amount that they're taking in, which is where the you know the meat and potatoes, if excuse the, the, the pun there, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, is about. So they're, they're too caught up on the fine details and they miss the, the big picture. Yeah. It's, I mean, people go, it's that simple. Yeah, it is that simple. It is that simple. It is that simple Imperial. physiologically. But then you bring in, you know, the psychological and the environmental factors yeah. and all the other shit that goes yeah. on. Then it's not so simple. No. But if you keep somebody in an isolated chamber in the gaff, don't let them go out yeah. and just give them a certain amount of food. It's they very predictable. You will not go anywhere else but lose weight. And they went. But once you let out into the big bad world and you see all the, the yeah. neon signs, all new rules, <laughs> it's all the, all changes. That's how it is. Yeah. Ben Dunn had a. Uh, well, I'm not sure we did, but this one was told he had like you know vending machines just outside in the in the reception. So you're in running on the treadmill, but yeah. out and get a bar, and then you're yeah. a little hamster in the wheel. Yeah, yeah. Well, you gotta you gotta generate the revenue somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I also I guess it's a good business model because it guarantees the uh, security there. You, you're clients are going to keep coming back to yeah it, yeah it's just a little conveyor but run yeah. on the hamster wheel little hamster <laughs> wheel uh talk to you about train intensity and muscle building what's your thoughts on that um is this specifically for for combat sports or just in general just in general well in general we, we tend to associate people with a, a a low body fat and a high muscle mass we associate that with health and i guess there's a lot of reasons for that people that are sick let's say people with HIV positive, people with cancer, they have a low muscle mass. Um, people that are, are starved, they have a low muscle mass, low body fat. The only people that tend to have a high muscle mass and a low body fat are tend to be people that have good continuous access to a, a, a nutritious food supply and they're living a, an active, healthy lifestyle that's giving them allowing them to maintain that muscle mass so then you, i guess you can take that to the extreme where mm. you get to something like let's say the, the hollywood um action heroes of the of the 90s where you got these like um you know extremely heavily muscled lean guys mm. um or if you if you take um you know bodybuilding that's mm. kind of taken that above and beyond mm-hmm. For most sports, there's an optimum, and this is where we get back to to combat sports. Mm. Yeah, there's advantages to to having increased muscle mass, more more power, more strength. But there's a certain optimum. If if you wanted to perform well, it's not necessarily just putting on more and more muscle, more mm. and more strength. This doesn't necessarily correlate to better performance. So if if you look at somebody like um, like gymnasts, for example, mm. um, these guys are extremely strong. But if they, if they if they put on more muscle, it's it's gonna it's the extra weight's gonna hinder them. So they reach a, a certain sweet spot. And again, there's a happy medium there okay. where where they reach. So I I think a, a lot of it is um, is driven by what people see in um, advertising and, and the media. Aesthetics. And I think aesthetics. And I think there's a, a definite trend now away from the from the heavier um, muscle guys that you might have seen a, of a decade ago. That you'd seen in Powerhouse or something? It, well, exactly. Or if, if you look at, um, like, Liam Nielsen. If somebody said you're going to be a, um, an action hero, in the future, people would have, he would have laughed if you told him that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, like, that's a now, good one. Yeah, now he is. I mean, where are all the you know the Dolph Lundgrens and Schwarzeneggers yeah. and Sylvester Stallones that kind yeah. of a, they become yeah. kind of dinosaurs a bit, and that's what the 
the, the, the fast conditioning uh, training program just giving a quick plug here yeah and um, that's why I'm I'm hoping that this is going to appeal to a newer aesthetic and people maybe more performance orientated I love it I had a look at it today now I looked at it when I first seen it when I came out whatever at the time you got work from Connor and I looked at it and I went that's brilliant that's specific and I don't I can't understand why more people like yourself or you're not working more with athletes you know a new breed of, of training I think it's just unbelievable yeah I, I mean I guess for a lot of sports they're, they're doing their sport specific training and, and it was developed as a, a supplemental form of training that people can do along with their skill specific training um, just for the for the conditioning component so we, we'll, we'll see how it goes we have um it's a it's a web based version now. We have um, mm. an app based version coming out in about oh, a yeah. month's time. Yeah, savage. Mm. Daddy, I look into that. Yeah. Uh, another question I was going to ask you was books. Are you fond of books? What what books do you read, or what's your? Do you know I kind of burnt out uh, on, on reading on books on reading. I when I was in medical school, I, I read through books at such a phenomenal rate because it's such a fast moving course and there's so many aspects to it that um i, I learned to speed read um i used to do that yeah i mean it, it certainly it, it'll work it's it's not reading for pleasure you're not going to read a novel like that mm. but you can pick up on the important um content and it's 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 been shown that the quicker you can read something the, the better you're able to pick out the the most important details in something if you're slow reading it you tend to get bogged down and you, you're lost on, on what the overall picture was. So it's good from that standpoint, but I kind of lost the pleasure of reading. And I guess at the same time, the internet was taking off. So mm -hmm. now I tend to use a lot more web-based stuff than, than books, cool, than paper cool. books. What, what do you think, are, just we were talking about health a minute ago, are the markers of health that you would rate? If somebody wants to check whether they're healthy or not, you know, I look at homeocysteine levels, waist circumference. What do you think? Well, health markers. Yeah, th these, 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 are, these are quite specific markers. Um, but as I was saying before, it, it depends what, what you consider a health. Is it, is it freedom from disease? Is it longevity? Is it, is it performance? It, it depends what it is. So they're, they're, all different. they're all different things. Health tends to be a bit of a, a catch-all. Like, you know, but, people worry about the cholesterol. I think cholesterol is bullshit. You know, I'd be more looking at my homeocysteine levels, you know, inflammation markers. What's yeah, but, but again, again, these these are, are, are quite specific things. And there's other aspects that if you have something that you're not able to change, well, there's not much point in, in doing tests or, or trying to wish that you had better genetics or different genetics. <laughs> And an example would be cholesterol. A lot, a lot of that is um, hereditary. Absolutely. So you can you can alter your diet and and do all sorts of things and exercise. Take statins. Well, statins will will they work? <laughs> but um, it doesn't really matter how much you exercise or what you eat if you have a, a genetic predisposition to yeah. have unfavorable blood lipid profile. Yeah. You're pretty much stuck with that. Yeah, well, the statins, they, they, they will alter that, but you're... They come with another risk as well. They do come with other risks. I mean, obviously, it's nobody really wants to take tablets, but no. it's whether you're deciding, is this lifestyle the, the lifestyle I want? Do I want to, to take this tablet um, or do I do I not want to take this tablet? How do I want to live my life? So I think there there isn't one one size fits all a lot of this has to be tapered tailored for the individual um as i said i i prefer the um you know burn fast rather than the, the than the long and slow yeah <laughs> yeah there's no point living long if you have a miserable life no live no. short and have the crack i think so Is that your... but it's not for everybody no that's no. just that's just me <laughs> um i mean when when i was 20 i i was i was taking risks cause i was sure i'd never see 30 then when I hit 30, well, I thought, well, I might as well give it a go now. I have nothing to lose. <laughs> I'm not going to hit 40. And, and now I'm still trucking along. And now I'm kind of wishing that you know, maybe I'd uh, 
hadn't taken so many risks, but hey, I'm still here today. So. And you're looking a great nick, as oh, my okay, mate said, so you yeah. must be doing something right. Yeah. So that leads me on to the next question. You talk about the FAST programme and it's it's going well, the app's coming out. What's the future? What's what's the plans with you going forward? What are you, what's, what are you up to? Um, I have a, a, a couple of different um, projects that, that I'm working on at, at the moment. Um, the, the app's taking up... Um, quite a bit of my time and I want to improve on that and I think there's still a few uh, records there's a few goals that uh, I, I want to set uh, I, w- I want to try and get the human um, powered land speed record um, yeah so I'm working on a, how, how to get about that this is the the speed record done behind a, a car so right it's just the, 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 the top are you speed. like you'll tell you'll be on a bike on the bike, um, I read somewhere that you're thinking of coming back out cycling again. You were getting a bike uh, built. Yeah, I, I have. I had a, a new bike built, a new. Um, and you're gonna be track. back competing again. It's not 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 in regular bike competition. This is just a record attempt. Oh, that, just that, that, just specifically specifically for that. just to 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 set a, a land speed record on a bike. Wow! So the bike is built and all. No, 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 no. That's still it's still in the very early. It's in the, um, infancy, still in the infancy. Where did I get this information from? Yeah. No, the other bike was is a it's just a, it's a bike for just for training. On. All right. It's not an actual speed record attempt. Bike. Okay, cool. So um, no, sure. this would be a, uh, like maybe be- vaguely recognizable as a bike. It's a it's a speed record a, attempt bike. It's not. It wouldn't have much in common with your. It's your average person that's riding around the bus. No, you're, uh, you're Rally Borner. No, It'd be a little bit no, different. It'd be quite a bit different. So, involved in the, the app, you did back at cycling. Uh, any more stuff coming up with Connor? Is, is there there's fights coming up? Is there, or what's happening with that? Yeah. He's well, going back into camp, or? Yeah, we're, we're well, Connor's keen to get back in um, for another fight. There's, there's a couple of little glitches that have to be ironed out uh, first. But once they're out of the way, um, yeah, Connor's he's training and he's he's chomping at the bit and he wants to get back into it. I mean, basically, uh, he just likes to to fight. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't understand that or they they don't get that. They they think that because he has money now that he, he he's not motivated. But um, if you look at the the fights that he's chosen in the past and the routes that he's taken and the, the, the deals that he's turned down. He's turned down big Hollywood uh, movie parts and deals simply because he he wants to fight and he, he doesn't want to do that. Yeah. So he, he's chosen, a, he'll, he sometimes chooses the, the harder, the tougher line yeah. um, because that's just what he is and that's what he does. Yeah. Have any, has anyone ever tried to uh, fish you away or get you to come into other camps, other MMA fighters? Because like, I, I just think it's, it's a no-brainer to get you involved. Like your knowledge, your background, your your understanding of the, the, the physiology. Well, like, I, I do work with um, some of the some other athletes as well that are in, in the UFC. Brilliant. Um, and a lot of the, the guys in the straight blast gym. Yeah. So um, I think it's the way forward. I, I just really do. It's just a no-brainer. You know, get some yeah, well, life it, it, As, as I say, it's a it's a sport that's evolving and it's, it's evolving great. fast. And you, 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 it, while you watch it, you can see techniques that 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 come and and get perfected. And it's it's just become a a more structured, a more refined sport now. I think the the, the next big step is just for more um, acceptance of it as a sport. Um, boxing it seems to be more socially acceptable than, than MMA. It's been around longer, isn't it? It's been it? around longer, and I think that's the only reason why. Yeah. Injury-wise, I think I would rather be a professional MMA fighter than a, a boxer because yeah. um, you can be choked out. You can. Th- there's multiple ways that you can be submitted in yeah. MMA. In professional boxing, it's basically just uh, the head is the target, and yeah, yeah. you're just getting continuous head trauma. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's possible to to have an MMA career and have very little trauma. I mean, if you look at the, the Icelandic fighter Gunny Nelson, yeah, throughout his career, he's had very little head trauma. He's still he's still sharp. He's he's uh, and he's had a, a good successful career. Yeah, great fighter. Whereas you, it's hard to find a professional boxer that doesn't have a, a significant degree of concussion and it will catch up with you. 
Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's tons and tons of research. So for anyone that's interested in getting involved with the the fast program, just what's the site you have? Yeah, if you if you go to uh, McGregor Fast, um, yeah. you're able to to find details and, and sign up there. You can just I'll put that in the the, the, the show notes as well, and people will just sign up for. It. And then, as you say, there's an app. There's an app that'll be coming out shortly. Yeah, deadly, deadly. Yeah. Right, well, look, this is possibly the longest interview I've had. I've well, you can edit it and get out all the... <laughs> no, I'm going to keep it. No, what I'm trying to say is I'll probably sit here for another hour with you, but you'll be getting sick of oh, listening yeah. to me. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up again. Yeah, soon. soon. Uh, all right, look, Jules, thanks okay. very much for coming to the podcast. You're an absolute gentleman. Not at all. It's been a pleasure. Fair play. Well, that's all we have time for on this episode. I'm absolutely honoured and delighted and so grateful to have had Jules Dalby on this show. Um, I've known Jules now a good few years, well, from afar, uh, from different clubs and train, uh, training places that we've trained at, such as we talked in the interview, Powerhouse. It was a small gym in Dominic Street. It was full of uh, character and some strange, strange people. And Jules and myself used to train there, so I know him as far back in the 90s. Uh, as a sports scientist and have done many a health fitness course, I, I feel like an absolute novice when it comes to, to that industry when sitting down with the likes of Jules. <coughs> His knowledge is and experience is unbelievable and far beyond my uh, knowledge. And it was just an absolute honour to sit down and share with him uh, and get the insights not only to his training, Conor McGregor's kind of life and the training those guys do um, was just an absolute honour. So I'm absolutely buzzing that we uh, got to sit down with Jules. So thanks very much, Jules. You're an absolute legend. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed the, the interview as much as I did. It was amazing. It was amazing. Um, as always, I'd like to thank Noel Riley from Rooney Graphics. Um, if anybody's interested in any graphic design they need done, check out Rooney Media or Rooney Graphics, wherever you like, try them out, they're an absolute bunch of sound lads, uh, also I'd like to thank Kevin Doyle, uh, Liberty's boy, always helped me out with the podcast when I'm stuck for sound advice and technical support, Kev, you're an absolute legend, thanks a lot man, uh, and Carolyn Harvey from ISA Nutrition, she's my new nutritionist at the moment, helped me out with my nutritional needs and get me ready for the summer, get me abs out, Thanks a lot, Carolyn. You're an absolute legend as well. Okay, guys, if you've enjoyed the show, please share with family and friends. Uh, subscribe on iTunes. We're also on SoundCloud, uh, Anchor FM, and Podbean, I think, also. So, yeah, get subscribing. Share with family and friends, and hopefully you enjoy the show. Over the next couple of weeks, we have more amazing guests. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Matt Bork, if you want to send me any... Uh, People that you might think would be interesting to come on the show, I'd absolutely love to hear from you. Uh, so wherever you are in the world, mind yourself, look out for your family and your friends, and take care of yourself. Have a good one. Bye bye. Self. 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 Have a good one. Bye bye.